Okay, we've talked about the anatomy, we've talked a little bit about physiology, and we've talked about the symptoms and how you can understand the symptoms. So let's talk about the actual diseases. When we look at the diseases, you can describe them as acute and chronic, so does it set in within uh, days or does it take years really to set in? So a huge difference. And then as far as where the site of the damage is, is it pre-renal or before the kidney? Is it intra or within the kidney or is it post-renal or something happening afterwards like maybe the ureters or the uh, bladder? Let's talk about the pre-renal first. So pre-renals all have one thing in common. They, they affect the blood flow going into the kidney. It could be because of blood loss. It could be because of volume loss, um, blood pressure loss. You're not getting blood flow to the kidney in any of these situations because your brain is freaking out. Your brain's thinking the blood's going somewhere else. I'm not getting enough blood, so it starts causing vasoconstriction to the kidney. The blood flow is cut off to the kidney and redirected to the brain. Well, the kidney needs blood to stay alive, so it's going to start shutting down. It can be acute stress, so way too much release of epinephrine causing the vasoconstriction at the kidney. Atherosclerosis, or decreasing the blood flow because of buildups or accumulations inside the walls of the arteries. And then we talked last week about hepatorenal syndrome, so if you want to go back and review, you can. Here's the little flow chart for hepatorenal again. And then some drugs, so uh, things like blood pressure medications can actually affect blood flow to the kidney. So again, pre-renal diseases, you want to think of things like shock, decreased blood flow. Um, when the kidneys go through multiple, or when the body goes through multiple organ failure, the kidney's one of the first ones to shut down because the brain's looking out for itself and redirecting blood to the brain and the heart, but the kidneys are deprived. They need 20% of the blood flow, so when they're not getting blood flow, not only do they not filter the blood for the rest of the body, but they also start shutting themselves down. And then here's one of the big signs of pre-renal is that when it kicks in or when it starts, if you decrease blood flow to the kidney, what do you do to GFR? You decrease the glomerular filtration rate. If you decrease the filtration rate, what happens to your urine production? It goes down. So your urine production goes down because you're not getting the blood flow to the kidney. So it's kind of a big sign. And that's one of the things that they look for with people that are going into shock because they're trying to maintain or wash their kidney. Um, in this situation over here to the left, you can see that this, had, this was actually a pinched off or um, decreased blood flow going through this artery and into the kidney and it atrophied compared to the other one. Here you have renal stenosis where this kidney's not getting blood flow and it actually shrunk compared to the other one, also atrophied. Now let's talk about intrarenal, so within. Intrarenal, you really want to think about the functional unit of the kidney. What's the functional unit? It's the nephron. So think about the structures in the nephron. Think about, could it be the tubules? Could it be the glomerulus? Um, what could it be that's being damaged? These blood vessels are single cell thick blood vessels. They can easily get blown out. The tubules, typically single cell thick, so they can actually be damaged very easily too. So infective agents, um, kind of like an infection, bacterial infection, sepsis getting in there. Remember, you've got a lot of blood flow going through the kidney. So if a bacteria gets in your blood, it's gonna go to the kidney and probably start doing some damage there. Hypoxia, this isn't the same as blood flow. Remember, if you have decreased blood flow, it's called ischemia. But if you don't have enough oxygen in your blood, the kidney doesn't get the oxygen and it starts starving and dying. The nephron needs oxygen. And then allergic reactions, toxins, and clogs, we're actually gonna talk about in detail. But just imagine, if you're trying to filter through these spaghetti strainers here, and they start filling up and getting clogged with things, they're not gonna work appropriately. So we'll talk about that. In fact, we'll talk about that first. So the glomerular disorders, there's kind of a group of them, and I'm not going to cover every single one, but there's a general idea that's happening. You have these things called glomerulopathies, and then they're affecting directly the glomerulus. Don't forget your layers of the glomerulus. You have the blood flowing through, and where the blood's flowing through, you have that little spaghetti fenestrations, these little holes for filtration. Right after the fenestrations, you have the basement membrane, and the basement membrane is kind of like a cottony rag that sits underneath your spaghetti strainer. So there's some things could potentially get through the spaghetti strainer, they're going to get caught by that rag. And then the outer layer that's going into Bowen's capsule is actually full of these little things called podocytes that have the filtration slits between them. So you really have three layers of the strainer that's trying to prevent things from getting through. But a problem that's happening with glomerulopathies are that number one, and this by the way is the pathophysiology that's happening in general to all the glomerulopathies. First thing you have happen is you have damage to the glomerular membrane surface. So you may have damage that blows it open, you may have damage that plugs it shut. In this situation, we're plugging it shut. So you have decreased glomerular capillary blood flow going through. Well, if you have decreased blood flow, what happens to your filtration rate? 
it goes down, which means you can't get rid of the things you want to get rid of. So you start seeing an elevation in things like creatinine and urea. So reduce clearance or reduced ability to get rid of it. All right. You might see start, start seeing sedimentation changes. So the chemicals like the electrolytes, calcium, urea, things that were already in the bladder or already in the ureter, ureters or in the renal pelvis, in that area, they might start sticking together. So you start seeing sedimentation changes. And then next, increased glomerular capillary permeability. After all that pressure has been built up for a while, you may start seeing it blow through. And this is kind of a transition. This happens after a little time. So it, the first symptoms might be a decreased urination. Then you might start seeing increased urination. And the problem with that increased urination is that you've just blown through these. The spaghetti strainer that was trying to catch things is now not able to catch the things. So what kind of things was it trying to catch before? Right, proteins, anything bigger than a protein. So now you might start seeing proteins slide through. You might see albumin, whole proteins. You might see even whole blood cells, like red blood cells. So those are some signs that this is progressing. You're actually permanently damaging this glomeruli. Because you're losing the proteins from the blood, if you reduce the proteins in the blood, the water doesn't want to stay in. So the water will follow some of the proteins into the urine, but the rest of the water will start moving into the tissues. So then you start getting edema. So you can see the progression as you're going through this damage. And then of course the major symptoms, you're going to see an elevation in um, blood urea nitrogen, elevation in creatinine, you're going to see edema. And depending on the rate of change, you might see it suddenly change. You might start seeing the symptoms come on really quick, or you might see them actually kind of insidious-like. So they slowly start changing over time. Let's talk about some specific types. So glomerulonephritis is actually an inflammation of that tissue, the glomerular tissue. So it's all inflamed, and what happens is you can actually, you lose the differentiation of the pyramids. My mouse doesn't want to work. So here you can see the cortex clearly. You can see the medulla kind of clearly, but you lose the differentiation of these pyramids. I don't know why my mouse is acting strange. Hold on. All right. Anyway, I'll just try to avoid using the mouse a little bit. But some things that cause this are like medications, certain chemotherapy drugs, um, antibiotics. Uh, if they do uh, testing, like dyes for testing, like radiologic imaging, those dyes sometimes can do damage to the glomerulus. So you can see kind of the breakdown of the symptoms over here, or symptoms, uh, causes over here. Man, my mouse is driving me nuts. And then glomerulonephritis is actually one of the most common causes of end-stage renal failure. Let's talk about it just a little bit more. So there are several types of it, but here are the general mechanisms. What happens is that things like antibodies start getting clogged up inside that fenestration membrane. So here are your membrane walls again. Here you have the fenestrations along the blood cells. Here you have that foamy, fuzzy um, basement membrane, and then you have the podocytes down underneath. So what happens is these antibodies, which are just real tiny proteins, real small proteins, they come along and they get, start getting stuck in here. This is one of the problems. And as they start sticking it in, it's almost like pouring um, you know, spaghetti water into your strainer with the spaghetti, but instead of just spaghetti, putting rice in there. Little tiny pieces of, of product. Well, the rice wants to go to the holes, and it's not big enough to slide through, but it's just the right size to get into the the hole and clog it up and that's what starts happening. So in this situation these antibodies and some complement factors start sticking over here and they start clogging up or gumming up the membrane. Well now you're not going to be able to let flow go through until eventually the blood pressure gets high enough it blasts right through and allows everything to go through. So let's talk about some of the causes. So when we divide these we can subdivide the different types into acute, rapidly progressing, and chronic. And a lot of the common causes for acute are actually strep infections. So strep, just like when we're talking about strep throat, oh, sometimes about a week to a week and a half afterwards, these people start getting this acute kidney dysfunction. So what happens is that the strep has these certain proteins on its surface that it releases. And when it releases these proteins, your body starts attacking those proteins. Well, those proteins will go along, they bind to the wall or the membrane of the glomerulus, and now suddenly your neutrophils, your macrophages come along and they start attacking it. Uh, sorry about this whole mouse situation, I don't know why it's not moving appropriately. But you can see the neutrophils and the macrophage come in and they start attacking the membrane. And we've talked about this before when we talked about hypersensitivities where 
your immune system accidentally attacks something. It wasn't meant to attack it, but it's trying to clean up antibodies and it's trying to clean up foreign antigens and it just accidentally attacks it. So that's one of the cases and that's caused typically by strep. So about 10 to 21 days after is when you start getting the full blown symptoms. So you start getting this clogged up, you know, these problems where maybe they decrease the urination, um, maybe a little bit of irritation around uh, the kidneys so they might start feeling a little bit of pain in the back. But about 10 to 21 days afterwards is when you start seeing this, the actual full blown symptoms. So hematuria, proteinuria. In other words, at this point, now the pressure has blown right through the glomerulus. You're starting to see protein and blood in the urine. Right. Next is rapidly progressing. So rapidly progressing is exactly that. It sets on quick and it moves really, really fast. What makes it a little bit different than the, uh, the strep infection is that, well, number one, it's not caused by strep typically. Um, a lot of times it's caused by things like lupus. So uh, lupus gets in and it starts damaging the membrane. Very similar to the way strep does, but not exactly the same. With rapidly progressing, what really makes it different is that, well, it uh, typically affects people over 50 and 60 years of age, but what's happening is that look at the wall here we, you can see that they've dyed or they've um, fluoresced these different fibrous proteins. So the damage is already done to the glomerulus and now you're starting to accumulate fibrous proteins in Bowman's capsule. So what's happening here is it's getting thick and basically scar tissue, right? This changes really quick and this fibrous tissue, you don't blow through it. So it gets rapidly progressive and can actually be fatal within days to weeks. Another one's called good pasture syndrome. And good pasture is where this is actually an autoimmune disorder. So unlike the last two, this one your body actually makes antibodies against the glomerulus. Boy, this mouse is driving me crazy. There we go. So antibodies against the glomerulus. Um, when we talked about this before, when we talked about hypersensitivities, if you remember the, different, uh, the four different types, type two is the type where it's an autoimmune attacking yourself. It attacks a specific organ and a specific type of tissue. So that's what makes good pasture syndrome unique is that it's actually targeting yourself. And it typically affects men in, their, in between 20 and 30 years of age. So they start having basically these problems with their kidney and then it can spread and cause other structures. So it could be a pulmonary hemorrhage, it could be complete renal failure. And then chronic. So chronic, the big difference the last couple we've been talking about acute situations, chronic can take literally years to actually happen. And it can be any of those prior causes, so it could be because of initial strep infection um, that caused damage to the glomerulus and it basically made a cascading effect over years. It could be because of um, antibodies against the glomerulus that are accumulating. And this GBM means glomerular basement membrane. So you have these deposit antibodies or you have that specific attack that's going on. And with chronic, usually the key symptom here is, is the hematuria. So a hematuria, in the initial phases, it can actually be microscopic, and you may not even see it. Where my mouse go? Okay, I might have to give up on the mouse completely. But you can see in the picture to the left, the right side has microscopic hematuria. It looks like normal urine, but there's actually blood in the urine, just small trace amounts. So you could actually, uh, a lot of times, test for this with just a regular urinalysis dip strip. So you dip the strip in and if it shows positive red blood cells then you might want to um, go in and look a little bit closer. And then as it progresses it just gets darker and darker and darker until you get this like smoky brown or cola is another way they describe it like soda, cola, cola colored um, material. And that can last for over 10 to 20 years before final end stage renal failure. And typically the treatment is they try and fix the underlying cause. So if it's an antibody, they might um, screen or do dialysis. They might uh, actually try and extract the antibodies. They might give you something else to help block it or bind to it. And then the end stage issues is they have to be put on dialysis or get a kidney transplant. All right, post renal. So now this is afterwards, all the flow going beyond the kidney. And here you can see things like mechanical or functional failure, kind of like we talked about in the GI tract. So mechanical obstructions are things are actually blocking, like a tumor, prostate swelling, 
um, like kidney stones, situations like that. Functional means it's something going on with the muscle. So maybe the sphincters aren't relaxing and it's causing blocked flow. Maybe the bladder smooth muscle is not relaxed. Maybe it's become fibrotic. So those are the kind of things you want to think about, just like we talked about in the GI tract. Is it mechanical, like an actual structure that's stuck in there or squeezing on, on the uh, pathway, or is it something to do with the muscle? So obstructive uropathies, we're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail. Oh, I was going to say, I thought I had more on this slide. Sure do. So here's kind of what's happening. You have this anatomical or mechanical and functional or functional failure. It interferes with the blood flow at any point along the pathway. So it can happen, I keep counting on this mouth, this mouse is just not working. But it can happen anywhere along the pathway. So it can happen up here in the real pelvis, it can happen in the ureters, it can happen down the bladder, even the urethra. Right? It's going to block the flow. It can happen on one side, so unilaterally. It could happen to both sides of the kidney. If it's happening down here in the bladder going into the urethra, of course it's going to block both sides. Right? So you get less drainage at this point. And then it starts dilating the pathway. Over here, if you look at the picture on the left, the right on the right side, which is that person's left kidney, you can see the dilation. Look at the swelling at the renal pelvis. That's what they mean by dilation. It dilates the urinary system. So it swells up, gets bigger. You're building up fluid and pressure back there. Right? Because that fluid's accumulating, the environment of urine is actually kind of nice for bacteria because there's not a lot of things that kill bacteria in there. So the bacteria can grow. Right? And then when the bacteria grows, of course, it increases the risk of UTIs. It compromises your renal function, your ability to get rid of electro negative electrolytes, waste products. Uh, prevents the ability to retain the important electrolytes and then eventually what happens is you have what we call obstructive uropathy. So let's talk about what happens. The consequences really depend on where the problem's at. So if the problem's in the renal pelvis, it's directly affecting the kidney. If the problem's all the way down by the bladder, then it can affect the ureters, it can affect the kidney, it can affect everything along the pathway. So like I said, it depends on where it's at. It depends on whether it's affecting both kidneys. So is it one or both? It depends on if it's a partial blockage, so is it just something that's, that's um, decreasing the flow or is it something completely blocking the flow? When you think of partial versus complete, complete is like when your toilet clogs and it completely runs over the edge, there's no flowing. Partial is kind of like when your toilet clogs and it comes up to the top and it makes you really nervous, but if you wait a half hour or 15 minutes and you look in the toilet again, the water has settled, you know, it's slowly been leaking out. So if you put a lot of fluid in there at one time, it fills up really quick, but it slowly leaks out, and that's partial versus complete blockage. Complete blockage would be like if you completely stuck a whole roll of toilet paper in there and it didn't allow flow. So I know sometimes my analogies are kind of uh, vivid, but hopefully it helps you remember it. So partial versus complete. So let's talk, oh, homework question. So where's the pain if the blockage is in the renal pelvis? Where's the pain if the blockage is in the ureter? And where's the pain if it's in the bladder? And I actually talked about this in the first segment when we talked about anatomy. So you can either look it up or you can go back to your notes and, and reference that. So, and I'm not, I, I almost slipped and told you about the blockages, but you can kind of watch where the pain is going so you have an idea. It's kind of like in the nervous system. When you see the symptoms, you can kind of figure out where the problem is at. But it's the same idea. There's some terminology here you want to get familiar with. And the first one's called hydroureter. And the hydroureter just means that the, the ureters are where dilating. So they're swelling up and they're inflamed. You can see it in the picture over on the left. On the top, you can see hydroureter being marked. So the ureters expanded. If you look down below at the two bottom pictures, it's the picture on the right. So you can see how expanded that ureter is. Right. Next one's hydronephrosis, and that's the renal pelvis that's swollen. If you look up at the picture on the top, you can see it's all swollen compared to the left side. If you look down at the bottom, the left bottom picture, you can see that all the structure of the renal pelvis is actually expanded and destroyed basically the medulla and most of the cortex. And you can actually see on the bottom right picture where both are happening. So you have the expansion of the renal pelvis, you also have expansion of the uh, ureter, so they call that urohydronephrosis. Okay, so compensation. The beautiful thing is you have two kidneys. If one starts failing, the other one will compensate. The problem is that if you damage that other kidney, the nephrons don't get repaired. So there's no increase in numbers of the nephrons. They just become hypertrophic. They just 
get bigger to try and compensate in the called compensatory hypertrophy. We talked about the first week of class. All right, so the size of the glomerulus, the size of the tubule starts increasing to accommodate for this extra um, you know, work that it has to do. Unfortunately, as we age, we have a decreased ability to compensate. So that's why you see a lot of renal problems in older people is because their kidneys don't compensate the way they used to. And then here's kind of the pathogenesis of what's happening. So the first step, you have that initial tubular damage decreasing the ability to concentrate the urine. And we've, we've talked about this. This is the best example with partial. So you didn't completely block it. So you have some flow still going down and out. But remember, you have that backed up fluid. The kidneys are constantly making urine. So if the ureter is too small to let that urine that's being made go through, it's going to start backing up in the kidney. And that's kind of like the... Uh, partial clog in the, the toilet example. So you start, you keep making the urine, keep sliding through, the other side will compensate and make even more urine. So what you see is actually an increased urine production with this. But the problem is that you can't conserve things appropriately. So because you're damaging the nephron, the tubules, you can't pull the sodium back in, you can't make bicarbonate, you can't pull potassium back in. So you start basically losing all these nutrients. Well, when you lose salt, what chases the salt? More water, increasing the urine volume. Right? Because you can't get rid of, of acids appropriately, you filter acids, hydrogen ions, but then you also secrete them. Well, if the tubules aren't working because they have all this problem, then they're not going to secrete the acids. So you're going to start getting acidosis. And that's going to start cooking the brain and causes things like nauseating, nausea, vomiting, upset stomach. You know, it might just cause level of consciousness to start changing. And then that partial obstruction irritates the lining of the tract, so you may cause an overactive bladder. And an overactive bladder never completely fills. These people, they put a little urine in there, it's so irritated they feel like they have to go, so they urinate. And a lot of times they don't even clear all of that urine, push it all out. So if you do a, an ultrasound, you might see remaining urine inside their bladder even after they've urinated. And then of course that urine sitting behind can increase microbial growth, which increases the risk of UTIs. And another problem might be a dysfunction in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So that renin angiotensin aldosterone system starts cranking up, and even though they're losing a lot of blood, or blood, a lot of urine, you might see hypertension because of all those effects of angiotensin. So angiotensin causing vasoconstriction, um, causing uh, aldosterone release, which goes down to the kidney and tries activating retention of salt, but isn't all that effective. Right. So once you've fixed whatever's, whatever's going on, then you can get post-obstructive diuresis. So post-obstructive, once you've cleared it, once you've fixed whatever the problem is, then suddenly they start having lots of urination, so diuresis. Right. It's usually mild at first, but it can be up to 10 liters a day. So that's a lot of pee. And the only image that popped in my mind is when I saw an elephant pee at the zoo one time, so I put that image in here because it's just feels like the flow is constantly going. 10 liters a day. Imagine five two liter bottles of soda. That's how much this person could be urinating in a day. That's a lot of fluid, which means they have to take in at least that much just to keep their, their fluid levels or keep hydrated. Right? And of course, they're gonna, become, they're gonna feel dehydrated and they're also gonna lose a lot of electrolytes with that. So the maintenance of that is basically making sure they're drinking a lot of Gatorade so they get their electrolytes. Right? So here are some things could happen with recovery. So they could have a partial um, blockage and that can still develop scar tissue so they get this growth of fibrosis within seven days it starts getting enlarged a little bit fibrotic within 14 days now it's interfering flow and by 28 days you actually see a total reduction in, in the cortex and the medulla where it was at because it's a lot of scar tissue and remember that scar tissue doesn't come back the nephrons don't come back so it takes well you can see about a month before you start having this more permanent change so it's a nice slow progress I shouldn't say nice is slow because it's damage in the kidney. There's nothing nice about it, right? And then with complete obstruction, you can see actually damage within hours. So if it's completely blocked, the urine keeps building up. And it's almost like taking a water balloon and keep filling it and keep filling it and keep filling it. Well, then, boop, it pops the nephron, destroys the nephrons. And then that's all replaced within scar tissue. So if it's within four weeks and you have this damage, it's irreversible at that point. Here's an example of some irreversible damage. Obviously, if the kidney's missing, then they couldn't fix it. 
But you can see in this situation, this was because somebody had a blocked ureter. It's sort of pushing the flow backwards. And you see in the top part of the kidney, you can still distinguish the cortex from the medulla. Gosh, I wish this mouse were working. I don't know. If... Nope, that didn't work either. Right, let's go back. So, oh, just a second, I had it. So here you can see the cortex along the top edge and the medulla, so the medullary periods, but you can see all of this tissue is blown out down in the bottom part. So the renal pelvis expanded, it started blowing out the glomeruli, the medulla, everything. Here you can see this person's kidney was totally shot. You can see that real thin edge of cortex around the outside. So there's a little thin cortex around here, but the medulla is completely gone. So you can see the calluses, you can see the, the pelvis, but this kidney was doing nothing. All right, so some of the causes of obstruction, of course, the first thing that probably pops in your mind is a kidney stone, right? But it can also be things like congenital malformations. So you can have abnormal growth in the ureter that's blocking the flow up. You can actually have in the bottom picture over here where one's not even connected. So they were born like this. They had the kidney, but the ureter didn't, didn't form appropriately. So what's really bad is that kidney would still keep producing urine because that's the kidney's job, but it would have nowhere to go. So it wouldn't take long before that kidney failed. All right, we're going to talk about some of these things like the stones and the tumors. So first, let's talk about different types of stones. So the first ter term is called nephrolithiasis, and this is talking about the actual stone building up in the nephron. So if you look at it really close, you can kind of see, I'm working really slow with my mouse, you can see these stones accumulating up here in the where the nephrons wrap. Over on that side was the medulla. Here you can see actually forming the calluses in the renal pelvis. If you did a scan or an x-ray, you can see all these accumulating in the, the kidney itself. It's not in the pelvis exclusively. You can see some in the pelvis, but you can see them all throughout the kidney. And there's what some of them will look like extracted. So some of the risk factors, women are, um, or women, men are more likely to have them than, than women. Uh, some races get it a little bit more, depending on the location that you live, um, can affect it. Your fluid intake's a huge one. Your electrolyte intake's another one. So Sometimes it doesn't matter how much fluid you take in, sometimes your pro body just processes the electrolytes and the calcium a little bit differently, which increases your risk, period. So there's some genetics that go into it, too. Right? This is the most common cause of obstruction in adults, and about 2 to 3% of the U.S. population will have um, at least one renal calculi or kidney stone before they're 50. Right? Most of the kidney stones, the majority, contain calcium. So it kind of revolves around calcium. There are lots of different stones. You can see uric acid stones over there. Um, you can have stones that are based off of magnesium. You have lots of different types of stones, but the calcium ones are the bulk, they're the primary type of stone. And what happens is that the calcium goes into the kidney. A lot of times it'll bind to phosphate. And when you put calcium and phosphate together, basically you're making bone. So it starts forming this bone, and it gets stuck wherever it's at. If it's up in the kidney itself and it gets stuck in the nephron, it can actually start eroding through the wall of the nephron. And at that point, it's almost like a tree making roots. It's stuck in there. So in that situation, they would definitely have to do surgery and go in and take it out um, and possibly even take out the whole kidney. But if it's in the nephron itself, it starts eroding through the wall of the nephron. It starts just pushing all the way through and basically starts calcifying the inside of the nephron. So there's no coming back from that. That would definitely have to be removed. Here's kind of a list. You can see the different types of stones. So this first one, calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. This is the most common one. You can see uric acids going to be another common one. And then some, <clears throat> excuse me, remember uric acid was actually uh, urea that's modified and stuck together. And then another thing that could happen is um, amino acids could stick together. And these bottom two are actually amino acids. They're more rare, but the amino acids get in there. And based on the pH, they start denaturating. They can stick together and form stones. So kind of things you want to watch for is that an acidic environment can actually cause stones to form faster, but so can a basic environment. So calcium oxalate, the number one most common, is actually typically caused by an imbalance in parathyroid hormone, which causes dysregulation in your calcium in your body. Um, drinking thing, or Taking in things with a lot of phosphates, the calcium and phosphates stick together, so things like soda, taking that in or having a very basic environment of the blood. So having your blood too basic or the pH too basic, having, drinking a lot of soda and PTH are the common causes of calcium kidney stones. Um, there's also like, um, they're called struvites, which are made of magnesium and aluminum and phosphate and stick together. Those are usually because of the way that bacteria work. So UTIs are typically causing these. And then the third one you really want to remember is that uric acid. And of course you know the uric acid. Um, what other disorder would they probably have 
at the same time. Gout, right? Because they have too much ure urea in their body, too much uric acid, they start accumulating in the joints and then in the kidneys. So, of course, with kidney stones, if they're blocking up the flow, then you see a decreased urine volume. Right? They, they feel like they have to go, but they just can't go because of this blockage. So here are your symptoms. You get the pain, or they call it renal colic. Um, it's not the same as when a baby's screaming kind of colic, but they call it renal colic, and it can be determined by the location. You already know this. If it's in the kidneys, it's going to be where. If it's in the ureter, it's going to be where. And if it's in the bladder, it's going to be where. I keep wanting to say exactly where it's at, but I, I said it in the very first lecture, and I had the homework question, so um, I'm trying to, trying to get you to go back and review that. So about half the patients will get actually nausea and vomiting. And think of it this way. If you're blocking up the urine, you're not clearing electrolytes, you're getting this imbalance. So things like acid building up is going to cause the brain to change. They a lot of times get chills and fever. They get hypertension because they can't clear the fluids. So a lot of common symptoms that go across the border here. And then this last part, if you can get rid of the stones, if they're less than a half of a millimeter, you have a 50% chance of getting rid of it. If they grow over a centimeter, there's no way you're getting rid of it. You're going to have to get surgery to get that thing taken out. So homework number five. What are three treatments for kidney stones? And I want you to give me um, treatments like one should be what the doctor can do in the hospital. One could be what kind of uh, medication could they give you. And then maybe a third one, I'll let you be creative and, and find the third one. Not creative, like make up your own idea, but look around and see what you can do. So I really want one that, that can be, because of what the doctor's doing for you, um, specifically what uh, medicine can do for you, and then I'll let you come up with the third one. So give me three good treatments. And then homework number six, what three things can be done to your diet to prevent future stones? So if you get it, and if you've had kidney stones, you already know this because the doctor tells you to change these three things right away, but what are the three common things? So go to a couple websites and look at them, and what are the three things you notice in common, usually the top three things, and write those down. And yes, for real, kidney stones can look like this agony one. Man, I just couldn't even, they're called staghorn. I, I couldn't even imagine having to urinate that thing out. All right, another problem that can cause obstruction is tumors. So renal tumors are actually kind of rare um, as far as tumors go. Uh, renal cell carcinoma, the actual cancer, is more common in people that are 50 to 60 years of age, more common in men, more common in smokers if you're obese or if you have hypertension. So they're rare cancers, but they happen, right? Then bladder cancers, about 1% of all malignant tumors are actually bladder cancers, so also kind of rare. They typically happen over the age of 60. One of the key things to remember that's different between renal and bladder tumors is that renal tumors, they're in this confined, thick, dense material. So as they start expanding, they're going to cause pain. You're going to feel the pain. But with the bladder, oops, I thought I had a picture. I'll go back to it. With the bladder, remember the bladder is a hollow organ. So as the cancer starts developing in here or tumor starts developing in here, it doesn't have to press outwards. It can actually start going into the bladder. It can start growing inside the bladder which just makes your urinary frequency more common, but usually in the early stages, they're really painless until they start growing and causing blockages or damage. When you describe the different tumors or the stages, it's just like we talked about in the cancer section. Stage one's isolated to the organ. Stage two, is it's moving beyond different tissues. So it's still in the organ, but it's changing from the original tissue and moving into the, the surrounding space of that organ. And then stage three, it spreads somewhere to like the lymph, and then stage four, it's metastasized to another organ. Right. Genetics can be a problem. So polycystic kidney disease is a genetic disorder. Here you can see um, there are actually two general types of polycystic. There's the adult onset type and there's the infantile type. The infantile type is autosomal recessive, which means, remember, you have to get a bad gene from mom and dad. A lot of times this also affects the liver. But you can see over here in the top picture, gosh, this mouse is driving me crazy, but in the top uh, picture, up there, you can see that the kidney that they actually took out of this baby. So that's a huge kidney, right? And it's full of polyps or cysts. And then down below, you can see another picture of the baby. This baby obviously didn't make it through, but you can see the kidneys. So you see the liver up there across the top, but then you see those two pink kidneys underneath, and they're enormous kidneys proportionally. Um, the next picture, you can see the sliced section with the, uh, the different cysts all over it. 
And then the very last one, you can see the adult onset, and you can see how many cysts are all over it, and the size of it. Um, I've seen pictures of a football sitting next to this cyst, uh, cyst covered kidney, and they're the same size. They're just huge, huge and enormous. The adult onset type usually doesn't start happening or giving symptoms until they're in their 30s or 40s. And a lot of times it will cause hypertension because the kidneys don't work and the fluid doesn't get cleared and then it causes that high blood pressure. Um, people with adult onset usually have kidney, kidney failure by the time they're 60. Well, I shouldn't say usually, about 50% of them do. Right. And then we'll let's talk about lower tract obstructions. So lower tract, you want to think the bladder. It could be stones, and then with the kidney stone, or kidney stones are different than bladder stones. They're the same materials, but where they're at is the difference. So urolithiasis is the bladder stone stones, where nephrolithiasis was the kidney stones. And then you can even talk about urethro. So urolithiasis is in your ureter. Right? You can have strictures, so it can be a urethral stricture, like from surgery or infections or injury. And remember, strictures you looked up. Before when we were talking about the esophagus and the GI tract, and basically strictures are abnormal narrowing of passageways, whether you're talking about the GI or the urinary tract. Um, in women, you see, in women you see uh, pelvic organ prolapse, like the uterus can flow, fold over, um, the cervix can start impinging, the rectum can actually fold over too. Uh, this is something that might happen more commonly after childbirth. So if the uterus doesn't compress back into its normal shape, and when we talk about reproduction, we'll talk about this again. And then with men, of course, prostate. So the prostate, when you look at the pathway, the prostate, prostate and um, the urethra go through the same passageway. So when you're talking about the vas deferens going to the prostate, the urethra going through the prostate, if that inflames, then they usually have ejaculatory problems and they also have urination problems. So there's obstructions. All right. Another problem that can be not a, an actual physical thing there, but a mechanical function or functional function. So you can have something called dysynergia. And this is talking about the muscles not working in sync. So normally what happens is that the sphincters that block urine from leaving are tight. And the smooth muscle that forms the bladder wall is relaxed, it's stretched. Well, when you go to urinate, you relax the sphincter and you squeeze the bladder muscle. But what could happen is you can actually maybe not be able to relax that sphincter. So sphincter can't relax. Or as the sphincter is tight, the wall of the bladder starts constricting and squeezing. So this can be a neurologic problem. It can be something going on with the neuron pathway. It can also be the muscles themselves. They're irritated and trying to contract. Either way, what happens is it reduces the compliance of the bladder. So the bladder doesn't expand completely, and you can't full complete, fill completely. So they get a lot of frequencies of symptoms here. They feel like they have to go to the bathroom a lot, but nothing really comes out or very little comes out. And overactive bladder is actually one of those problems that comes along with that. So symptoms that revolve or that are around this blockage, are these, they feel like they can't get empty completely. So they feel like they have to go to the bathroom a lot. They feel like they just went to the bathroom, and then five minutes later they have to go again. Um, what's happening is that obstruction, the muscle, the detrusor muscle that's in the bladder squeezes, and the more it's squeezing, the more strong it gets. So you get the stronger muscle. It starts growing. It's hyperplastic because smooth muscle can, can do that. It grows in numbers. The wall gets tighter, more fibrous. It doesn't stretch as much, so they have to pee more frequently. So it's kind of, that's the pathophysiology of what's happening. And then the symptoms, of course, they have to pee a lot. A lot of times they have painful, so dysuria, uh, painful urination. And sometimes they'll have nocturia where they have to pee a lot in the night. If they have to get up two or more times in the night, they call it nocturia because their bladder can't expand like yours or mine. So let's see if I can get this mouse to stop the slide and we'll come back in the next set, the last set.